Custer comes off that divide, his biggest fear, this village is going to run away. They're going to scatter. It doesn't matter if there's 5,000 warriors. They're going to run. He orders an immediate attack. He comes off the divide at 12.15. He orders Captain Frederick Benteen off to the south with three companies, 130 men. Benteen hates Custer's guts. Has no use for him. He questions his orders. General, if this village is as big as they say it is, we're going to need every man we've got. You have your orders, Benteen. Follow them. You're dismissed. Benteen hates Custer. Custer hates Benteen. Reno hates both of them. <laughs> Reno and Custer come off the divide, 12 miles out, 7 miles out, 3 miles out to the river. The scout Gerard sees 60 warriors racing to the north. He screams out, there go your Indians, General, running like the devil. Custer sends immediate orders to Major Marcus Reno, second in command. Major Reno, the village is just ahead. Move forward at as rapid a gait as you deem prudent. Pitch into anything, and you'll be supported by the whole outfit. Reno crosses the river. He cinches up his equipment, tightens his saddle girths, and charges down towards the village two and a half miles beyond. He's got 140 men. Inside that camp, it's chaos. They didn't expect any battle. They just whipped George Crook a week before. How come a puny group of soldiers would attack such a big camp? They're caught off guard. The village criers scream out, Ota! Ota! The charges are coming! The long knives, the blue coats, old women hobbling on sticks trying to get away. Young mothers racing around frantically trying to find their children who are swimming and playing. Inside the camp is Sitting Bull. He's 45 years old, too old to fight but not to lead, exhorts the warriors on. Brave up, brave up, strong hearts to the front, cowards to the rear. <clears> Hope <throat> okay, hey, it's a good day to die. Young boys, 13, 14 years old, they roar out of the village on horseback, try sa tie sagebrush to the backs of their ponies' tails, and ride back and forth, creating a giant dust cloud. As Reno thunders down the valley floor, faster and faster and faster, at 500 yards, he knows two things. Number one, the village is not running away. And number two, he's never fought the Sioux and the Cheyenne before. At 300 yards, he screams out, Halt! Dismount! Form skirmish lines! Now, fight on foot! 130, so 40 soldiers attempt to ring in their horses at 30 miles an hour. Private Smith and Turley, two city boys, they can't even stop. They go right into the village. Their heads later found on poles. 138 men dig in. Every fourth man is a horse holder. He takes his horse and three others, pulls them off the battle line, back into the timber, away from the firing. Protect the ammunition packs. Now there's 90 soldiers, five yards apart, spread across that battlefield in skirmish line formation. And in 10 minutes, they'll face a thousand warriors. The company commanders order volley fire. They take their big bore Springfield carbines, 45, 55 trap door. It shoots a big bullet. If it hits you, something's gonna fall off. They open the trap, drop in the cartridge. Close the trap, cock the weapon, 90 guns, ready, aim, fire, boom, 90 guns go off at once. The bullets rip into the teepees, double cock, open up the trap, kick out the spent shell, throw another one in, close the trap, ready, aim, fire, boom, another 90 rounds. The bullets crash into the teepees, dropping some of them on the ground. Inside the camp, there's a warrior named Gall. He's six feet tall, he weighs 250 pounds. His two wives and three daughters are killed by Reno's charge. When he found out, he said, it made my heart bad, and I fought with a club. Gall, Crow King, Two Moon, Low Dog, they roar out of the village and slam into Reno. They drive him off the battle line. He falls back in along the river, sets up for a second stand. 
but now the warriors light the grass on fire. They snap buffalo blankets trying to scare the horses, and they shoot at the horse holders. Reno's feeling very uncomfortable. He finally screams out to the scout, Bloody Knife. Bloody Knife, what are the Indians going to do? Boom! Bloody Knife takes a bullet right in the head. His hot brains and blood go all over Reno's face. Reno has a temporary stroke entitled post-traumatic stress syndrome. <laughs> he barks out conflicting orders. Mount! Dismount! Mount! Guys are going up and down like yo-yos. And then he barks out the command, those who want to make their escape and live, follow me. He crashes out of the timber, races back towards a river crossing a mile beyond other soldiers trying to catch up. It's a rout. There's no attempt to cover the retreat at all. Warriors right up next to the terrified soldiers and pump their Winchester rifles into the command. Boom, 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 boom! Two Moon said, we mowed the soldiers down. It was like a buffalo hunt. We came up behind the soldiers, slipped our bowstrings over the soldiers' heads, jerked them off their horses, and pounded them with war clubs. We counted coup, which means to touch an enemy with a stick. You're not brave. Why are you here? You should have brought more soldiers. You better go back and get more. Forty men will die in this race with death through a gauntlet of hell. They get to the river crossing. Horses plunge off the bank, crash into the stream, flounder, and men drown. Warriors on top of the ridges rain bullets into the crossing. Folks, the river was red with blood. This was war. It wasn't cowboys and Indians. It wasn't John Wayne. It was war. Reno scratches and claws across the river, gets on top of the high ground five miles to the south of us. You can drive right to it. He is a fractured commander, and his battalion is whipped and demoralized. About ten minutes later, Ben Teen comes up, rides up to Reno and snarls, Where's Custer? Reno says, for God's sake, Benteen, halt your command and help me. I've lost half my men. Benteen's got a message in his pocket, a note. It's from Custer, delivered to him by Giovanni Martini, the Italian orderly of the day who cannot speak any English. He hands a note to Reno. It reads, Benteen, come on, be quick. Big village, bring packs, P.S., Bring packs. Neither one of those officers is going to respond with any sense of urgency to that order. It will haunt them for the rest of their days. In the meantime, Custer has stayed up on top of the bluffs and come to the north with five companies, 210 men. He tries to go down the ridge into Medicine Tail Coulee, a mile and a half out in front of us. You can drive right to it. It's a freeway into the Cheyenne camp. But Cheyenne warriors slam the gate closed. They have to fall back up the hill. Custer unites on Calhoun Hill at the end of this ridge line, past those cars on top of the ridge where it rises up. Three clumps of green brush on the end of the ridge line. That's Calhoun Hill. James Calhoun, Custer's brother-in-law, digs in forms a skirmish line facing the south with about 80 men and for 45 minutes he flails away trying to hold the warriors back. In the meantime, Lieutenant Colonel Custer rides out beyond us with probably 80 soldiers, two companies, goes out to the current cemetery down off the bluffs. We believe he's going to try to cross the river, capture women and children and non-combatants who have run to the north, capture them and the fight's over. This is based on Indian warrior survivor testimony and archaeological accounts. But he cannot get there. He has to fall back. When he comes back up to the cemetery, he gets up on top, drives warriors off the top of the hill just about the same time that Gaul and Crow King and Toon and Low Dog, after pounding Reno into hopeless submission, peel off of him, roar down and slam into Calhoun Hill like a red tidal wave. Company L is blown off the ridge. James Calhoun is dead. Tom Custer, two Medal of Honor recipient, T Captain Tom Custer, C Company, they charge down the ridge 700 yards out in front of us, driving warriors back. But a Southern Cheyenne chief named Lame White Man 
gets off his horse in the middle of battlefield, turns around to the warriors and says, Come back! There's not that many soldiers. We can kill them all. And they rally up behind lame white man. They storm back up the hill, crash into C Company. They snap buffalo blankets and scare their horses off and capture guns and ammunition. Most of C Company boys are now unhorsed. They run to the top of the ridge. Crazy Horse flies down the west side of the river, crosses right below us that deep ravine, 250 yards out in front of us. He flies up the ridge with 800 warriors behind him. He goes right over the top of the hill where that van is on the crest of the hill. The other warriors hang back. They're, look up here, folks. Look up here. 200 yards out in front of us. They hang back. They're hesitant. They hear gunfire. But Crazy Horse has no fear. Bullets and arrows in his vision can't harm him. He goes right over the top of the hill where that motorcycle is, charges down onto Captain Miles Keel, the fighting Irishman. Forty dismounted soldiers fire at Crazy Horse all at once. Boom! They don't hit him. They reload a second time. White Bull goes over the top of the hill. They don't hit him. Boom! Another 40 guns. Crazy Horse, White Bull, inspired the other warriors. They pour up over the top of the ridge, charge down onto Keo, smash into Keo, and grind Keo into Gaul, who's overrun Calhoun from the south. Company I is blown off the planet. I Company extinguished. The other side of the ridge will tell the story. The markers look like corn. <clears throat> Keo is dead. Three days, they'll three days later, they'll find Keo's body, stripped to his socks, but unmutilated. He's Irish Catholic. He's got a big medal around his neck from the Pope. They don't mutilate him like the others. His horse, Comanche, will survive this fight. Eleven battle wounds. The horse is nursed back to health. <clears throat> Follows the command, taken back to Fort Lincoln. That horse will live another 15 years. Became known as the only survivor. Keo is dead. Calhoun is dead. C Company is crushed. On top of the hill, Lieutenant Colonel Custer digs in, and now the full fury of 2,000 warriors bears down on the last anthill. Folks, look up there. 136 years ago, the sky was raining arrows, gunfire, smoke, yelling, screaming, cursing, more ammo, more ammo. Gaul said, the soldiers were fighting good. They were loading and firing and loading and firing, but then about 35 of them or 40 bolted down the hill 100 yards out in front of us, six or seven on horseback, the rest running. We chased them down into deep ravine and killed them all. 28 men found dead after the battle in a crack in the earth at the bottom of this trail. On top of the hill, it's desperation. Two moon, we swirled around the soldiers like water around a stone. Low dog, the soldiers were fighting good, but then they threw their carbines away and took out their little guns and tried to kill us. But they shot wildly in the skies. Their horses bucked and shied and pulled them all around. A desperate order. Shoot your horse. Boom! A bullet in your horse's head. After the fight, there's 39 dead horses on the ridge. There's nowhere to run to. There's nowhere to hide. And you're not going home. Warriors get closer and closer and closer. Wooden Leg said it looked like a thousand dogs in a fight. You couldn't tell one from the other. They asked Gaul, how long did the battle take? He said about as long as it takes for a hungry man to eat his dinner. And then, the shots. Quit coming. young boys and old men, mounted in the draws in the ravines, storm the hill on horseback, ride right into the soldiers and pound them to death with war clubs. Then they roar down to meet Reno and Bantine, who would made a feeble effort to advance to the sound of the gunfire, drove them back, pinned them down, trapped them for the next 30 hours under siege, 
Captain Benteen will take over for a shell-shocked Reno. It's a groundhog case, man. It's do or die. Dig rifle pits now, and they began to scratch and claw at the ground with cups and spoons and pocket knives. Those rifle pits are still there. Thirty hours later, late afternoon, Monday the 26th, the massive village begins to break up, scatter to the south as they detect the advancing military column of Gibbon and Terry from the north. And by the time the sun goes down Monday evening, there's not a warrior in sight. Captain Benteen has saved 350 men on top of that hill. 53 dead, 52 wounded. 60 to 100 warriors killed in the battle of the Little Big One is over. 